Welcome to our broadcast. We are thrilled that we have the opportunity to come into your life today. If you have a copy of God's Word, we invite you to Matthew chapter number 6 this morning. Matthew chapter number 6. I don't know if you can preach on prayer without having to, or having to, or talking about, or reading, at least uh, sharing about the Lord's Prayer found in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we're going to do that today in just a moment as a text. Uh, seeking, speaking, and sensing. Earlier in the week, knowing we were going this direction, a uh, pastor friend of mine, I was talking to him about prayer. And one of the, probably since we moved here, I would say probably the greatest prayer that I know as a pastor here. Um, and I was sharing with him about that, and I was along the line of seeking and speaking, and he sent me back a text, and it said, and, and listening. So out of that, in the next day or so, I thought, you know, that is it. So we, we uh, put the word uh, sensing in there, that sometimes we just need to sense the Lord and, and that. So we're going we're gonna to unpackage this for us uh, today and uh, go a little different direction. We're going to have an interlude in the middle of the sermon. Isn't that exciting to think about? Uh, interlude means you're going to hear two different sermons, but you know, it's, it's not quite that much. But uh, I want to say something before, we, uh, before I have you stand for the scripture. Uh, today's a, a, a tough day. Uh, this day and age is tough. Uh, I had to make some decisions yesterday. Um, if, you'd, if you'd have told me that in, the, in, in my lifetime of ministry, there would come a time where we would advise people not to come to church, I would have told you, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I've done that more than I care to admit. Uh, anybody has an issue. And it's amazing how the work, I told somebody, one of my spiritual gifts is making people feel bad. Uh, somebody comes to me and feels like, well, I don't think I want to teach this class anymore. I don't think I need to. And, I'll, and give me about 10 minutes, I'll have them feeling so bad about it, they'll, they'll, they'll re-up for five years, not just for five months. But one of the things that we've had to come to grips with is uh, this, is not an, uh, this is not a time for us to persecute. It is not a time for us to wonder how somebody is or not or how comfortable someone is. Uh, that's why we've gone to the extent that we have with uh, the, the FM transmitter that somebody can sit in their car, and they are right now, by the way, and, uh, and as well as Facebook Live is going on, that people are in, there are probably some people in our church that are in their pajamas as we're preaching. But anyway, that's okay. Um, when we all get back to normal, we're going to have a pajama Sunday. I just want y'all to know that. So all of us can enjoy what it was like to sit at the house with pajamas on. We're going to all wear our pajamas to church. But seriously... There are some, it's some tough days, and uh, we had to make some decisions yesterday with the numbers the way they are, and, and um, you know, and, and I appreciate, I, I tell you, as far as I wasn't out much today, but I hope everybody has a mask on. It's not compulsory. While you sit, as I sent it out yesterday, while you're sitting there in a social distance type way, you can take your mask off. I, I think so. <laughs> but as we, as we interact, uh, let's do our best. Um, I have a pastor friend of mine that has covid um, he's a good bit older than me, and um, the first thing that I heard he said when he found out he had it is, God, I, Lord, and he wasn't saying that slang-wise, he said, God, I hope I haven't infected someone else. So it's serious business, but uh, I'll tell you something, we win. That's the great news, folks. I've come to tell you that, and uh, today I think God can help us because if we're by ourselves, we can still pray. If we're isolated, we can still have a relationship with the Lord. God set it up that way that you and I can come boldly into the throne of God today. And uh, right where we are. So I just wanted to share that. I know it's a little different. And uh, there's some, some that I'm going to keep from coming up in my sermon because some of this came up while I was preaching. And I just want to share that with you uh, this morning, okay? So if you're able, would you stand with us in honor of God's Word? Seeking, speaking, and sensing. In verse number 5 of Matthew chapter 6, we find these words. Of Christ, he was speaking. He was preaching, if you will, at, at Sermon on the Mount. This is what he said. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this, Our Father in heaven... Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord. I'll simply ask for my words to be yours and my thoughts to be yours. Lord, the, for the others that play a part in the next few minutes, I pray your blessings on them and lead them. And as Lord, as they lead us in prayer, I thank you, God, for the opportunity to connect with you. And God, as we continue to fulfill the call you placed on our life, would we all walk in obedience to what we hear today? And we would raise the level, we would raise the effectiveness of praying and prayers, prayer warriors in our church. Because Lord, if there's ever been a day our society, our community, our church, our individual lives needed, it's today. Bless and we'll give you the praise now and forevermore. For we ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Prayer, this is truly a giant Especially this day and age, I mean, we see it's our only way that we truly communicate with God. God predominantly communicates with us through His Word. We communicate God through prayer. When I think about prayer, there's some questions that come to mind. Why do we pray? <laughs> or people ask this, when do we pray? Where do we pray? And how do we pray? The disciples ask the Lord that. Teach us not to pray. Teach us how to pray. But you know why and when and where really come up. Some, some, some people, real intellectual folks, will say, why do I need to pray if God already, already knows everything? I'm sure we've all thought that. There's some neat things within those, those, that, that context, when to pray, where, and how. I hope I answer those in the next few minutes for you. So many people today, when it comes to prayer, have passed it off as a regimented act that shows our allegiance and diligence to be Christians. We really don't see it as communication. We see it more as a, a discipline. It's just something that you do because God commanded us to Many have dismissed it as being irrational and really look at it and go, why do I need to pray to a God that is holy and he knows everything and, and he's holy and I'm unholy? How does that work? Many people today that have even passed it off as they really don't see the relational part of it, of why things the way they are. But our sermon title is what I want to think about just for a moment is this. When we think about prayer, prayer is seeking God. Chase after him, talk to him, desire to want to have that communion, community with him. I'll tell you what I know, the older I get, uh, I have one child now that lives hundreds of miles away. I enjoy it when I see my phone ring and I realize it's him a and I have the opportunity to talk to him. We need to understand that God likes for his phone to ring. He's our heavenly father and he wants to have that relationship. He went to great lengths to have the relationship that we can have with him. We're one of his children. Secondly, not only is it seeking, but it's speaking. In God's creation, he only gave verbalization to humanity. There's a lot of scientists and biologists think that other animals and, and parts of God's creation are communicating. I'll leave that all to them. But I know verbalization is only in humanity. And God gave us that. And sometimes it's in our head. Sometimes it's quiet. You might have already prayed today and you didn't verbalize it. Everybody didn't hear you praying. But you understand what I'm talking about. We're verbalizing to God. We're speaking to God about where we are in our life. And thirdly, it's sensing. And the older I get, what this meant to me in the last few days... And when I, after I talked to that pastor, and, and this is that I catch myself, and I was already there, is the older I get, the more I, hear, I, I find myself listening and waiting and resting in the Lord. Not just giving him my Kroger list or my Walmart list and telling God what all I need for him to do for me or for you and for us, but waiting on the Lord. So that's where that sermon title came from. Did you know today, thinking about this, did you know that since COVID has shown up, the stats have gone out the roof when it comes to the internet and people searching out, trying to find out how to pray. It's remarkable. In, in 2020, in the internet, there are more searches for prayer than in any of the previous five years. Think about that. In Europe, they found out data shows that in the, the very time that they released the number of COVID cases, and as they increase, the search for prayer increases. Growing concerns over health and safety and economic stability and civil unrest have driven many toward, or I should say back to, even a faith, their faith and prayer. I've said for years, you've heard me say it many times, it's original me, I think, unless I read it somewhere and forgot it. But the bigger something is in my life, I have to find someone that's bigger than it is. There are times I don't think I have to pray about things. God gave me common sense. He's given me intellect, maybe education, experience for me to know what I need to do. But there are some things, sometimes things that are bigger than me coming to my life. I've got to have somebody that's bigger than it. And I've got great news for you today. You need to hear this, is that God's not stressed out. Did you know that? He, he's, not, he's not having a Maalox moment. He's not chewing his fingernails. 
He's not sitting on, laying on a couch talking to a therapist right now. God is God. He's in control. He knew this yesterday, and he'll be the same tomorrow as he is today, and he'll be that way forever. Listen, what, well, those things people often think about, when do we pray? When do we pray? Most time we, we pray when it gets tight, you know what I'm saying? When, when things start changing, we, God tends to get our attention, and we, we become great prayer warriors until, the, the, until that subsides. But this is a great thought. You know when we pray? Most of the time, people, the majority of the time, people pray when a person is flat on their back. Heard this years ago that when we're flat on our back, the only way that we can see is up. And when I think about our society, when I think about what's going on 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 the planet, when I think about what's going on in our country, even our community, the unrest that we see in so many different departments right now, I just want to remind you that we're getting close to the flat on our back. I really believe it might have to get worse before it gets better. We might have to have more uh, travail. We might have to have more issues for us truly to have revival and turn to God. I see that in, in history, in world history, we know that to be the case. Let me give you some scriptures today. In 2 Chronicles chapter 4, chapter 7, verse 14, I should say. It's a staple, if you will. It's one that we hear often and see. But it, it says this out of the um, Christian standard. And my people who bear my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I want to show you something real neat, a conjunction that's here. You notice this word right here, then? When I think about this conjunction that's in there, so many people say, if I pray, God will hear me. If all I got to do is pray, God will hear me. But I, you, just for your consideration, if we're not doing the top of the verse, then God's not hearing And there's a lot of times that's tough for us to swallow. It's tough for us to comprehend. But we need to understand this. If you want to get a hold of God today, you need to come to him humbly. You need to seek his face. You need to be ready to turn from your wicked ways. And you need to pray to Almighty God. And when we meet those conditions, then God hears from heaven. He'll forgive our sin. He'll heal our land. And I think many times we just, we made God our own little piece. We, we made him our own. We, we brought him down to who, who we think he is. And we made him out to be. And we think God hears all the time. Matthew 7, 11 says, if, we then, if, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Who ask him? 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I grew up in an era, folks, it was almost uh, taboo. It was, how in the world you stand up and there's sometimes if you name it, you claim it, God will do it. God loves you that much. He'll give you the desires of his heart. And then these kind of verses here come along. I want you to know something. We need to hear this. We need to grow up in our faith a little bit and realize you really think God's going to do something that doesn't add up to his will at the end? You really think God's going to give us something that he's going to have to undo later on? It doesn't work that way. We need to realize that God will do for us what he needs to do. And when you and I get in tune, I believe it's everything about when we get in tune with his will and my heart is in tune with his heart, then the desires of my heart are going to be what God wants me to have and be. And then God starts answering. But I got to live like God wants me to live. First Timothy chapter number two, verse eight says, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and argument. There's a lot of stuff. When you try to preach a 25, 30 minute sermon on prayer, and there are just, I think, as many references I've seen of anything in the Word of God, anything, there's no more references than to prayer. Prayer has more references to it than any other thing I've ever searched. It's amazing. Even the love of God. Prayer, because that's, that's, enti- that's encompassed in that. But watch this now. Listen to this. There are many times we take stuff so far out of context. Listen to this verse. Listen. This is the God. Listen. We need to know this. Therefore, I want men in every place to pray. God's desire for us in his inspired word, Paul is telling Timothy, in his word, he wants everybody to pray. Isn't that good? Good stuff. But then he tucks this away, lifting up holy hands without anger and argument. And all of a sudden you go, well, what in the world does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. You ready? Today there's a lot of controversy about worship. I guarantee you there's somebody either listening on Facebook, and please don't tell me that you're that person, somebody out in the parking lot, or somebody in here, that the worship team sang a song that's a little bit too much, it's too edgy for you. That's a little too contemporary. I sort of like those old hymns. And then there's somebody this morning that when they started singing a hymn, a reference to a hymn, they, I don't like those hymns. Man, I like that blowing and going music. It's amazing how we're all different. If you don't think we're different, look around. We're different. But what we've got to understand is this. When I get ready to worship the Lord, and when I get ready to connect with God, When I lift up a hand, 
His word says that hand needs to be holy. And let me tell you what that means. If I know I got sin in my life, you know, if I know I'm not living where I need to live, I'm not connecting with the Lord the way I need to. See, I connect with the Lord when it's under the blood and I'm living like God needs me to live. Then he has my attention. And when I call on his name, he knows who's calling on him. I only got one wife. What I've been trying to do lately is take my wife out of the sermons a lot. Take, take, you know, I went back and listened. I talk about my kids a lot, but I only got three of them. I want to announce publicly. I only have three kids. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. I only have one wife. Good Lord willing, I'll live longer than her. I only have one, but listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. I know what it's like in my house when we're not getting along. Huh? I know what it's like when we're not, in, we're not <laughs> got it going on. I know what it's like with my kids when there's an issue and they run through the den. Don't even tell me, hey, or I know how it is, but I'll tell you what, I know what it's like when it's right. And what this scripture is saying to us is that if we're going to pray, we need to be right. Lift up holy hands. I don't need to sit on the first row and raise a hand and God in heaven knows I got sin in my life that I'd rather have in my life than to have him in his right place. And I sit there and raise up my hand like everything's fine when I know in my heart it's not. Lift up holy hands. In other words, we're going to worship and we're going to pray. Then we need to be right with God when we do. And if not, that's the great news that we have an altar. That's the great news. You can get it right when you come into God's house so that you can worship him in spirit and in truth. In truth, by the way. Listen, one more. James 5, 16 says, Therefore confess your sins one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in effect. A lot of time today. If I have time to unpackage all this, I'll just give you some food to thought, for thought. If we're not real with each other, then I wonder how many healings we've missed. Hmm? Well, preacher, I can't start confessing my faults out here in the church. Everybody's going to tell it on, on Twitter. Everybody's going to tell it on Facebook. Everybody's got a best friend that they're confidentially going to tell it to, and then that person has a friend that they're confidentially going to tell it to. And so we tell it throughout the grapevine confidentially. Here it is. I really believe everything about me. If we want to see a move of God at Lakeshore, if we want to see a move of God, let's say America, we want to see a great revival that happens in Mississippi, it's going to happen when people in the church start getting real. Confess your faults one another. We've allowed the world to so infiltrate the church that I ain't going to tell anybody about anything. Hmm. Do you really know me? The circle of influence, the circle in my life, do, I really, do you really know me? Do we really have any kind of groups where somebody could actually bear their real hard-hearted, I mean their real hardship issues in their life, confess that to a brother or sister in Christ? So I really believe if we start looking at this stuff in a real way, we will find out that the church has been affected in great ways by the world. Listen, that's just two of four. That's confidence and compassion. I'm thinking about these scriptures. Today I want to share this two with you, and then we're going to do something different. One is this. Prayer has components. Number one is this. When I think about prayer, I think about there's competence. It's going to be different than you think. It's not about having your head bowed. It's not about having a closet. It's not about all the things that we think about prayer. Clearing your mind. Really a little bit different. When I think about components for prayer, there are four of them. Number, the first two is this. There's competence. Hmm. What I mean by that is your head's got to be in it. Look around, folks. If there's ever been a need of prayer, it's today. You might not know this, but you might know it. In Isaiah 56, 7 was the prophecy. It came to pass in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, where Jesus said this. One thing he said about the church. He didn't say my church, he didn't say the church is going to be a great place for preaching. You can amen that right there. Don't hurt my feelings too bad, too badly. He didn't say that the house is going to be a great place for missions. He didn't say the church is going to be a great place for even sowing seeds and evangelizing. No. Jesus gave one attribute to his church, and he said, my church shall be a church, of, a house of prayer. Oh, there's competence. Luke 18, 1, there was a parable fixing to get shared, and Luke wrote it down this way. Men should pray and not faint, not give up. They should have a mindset, have a competence about them. Secondly, not only competence, but there's compassion. Not only should our head be in it, but our heart should be in it too. Listen very carefully. When I think along these lines, we need to ask the question, what moves us today? What moves you? It's easy this day and age, and I am standing up here guilty before you, that we live in a day where it's very easy to be calloused. It's very easy to be cynical and remove ourselves, to be jaded because of the world that we live in. 
Everybody has an opinion. Everything's out there. <laughs> it's amazing we think about it. And there's a wow verse that I want to show you today that has to do with marriage, and I think it applies to others as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, look at this. It says, for the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but it's, 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 you're holy. Listen to me. What I want to share with you is this. How does that work now? How in the world can an, an unbelieving husband be sanctified, be set apart, have the Spirit on him from the believing? It's not talking about salvation. Let me stop that, let me stop that thought with you. But we need to understand today is that the Word shows us that God honors the commitments that we make. And if I'm what I need to be, I believe this is what it means. If you're laying in the bed, if you're intimate with someone, having a relationship with someone that doesn't know the Lord, and you live like God wants you to live, the Spirit of God will be on them because He's honoring you. And this is what I believe. I believe it's going to be easier for that person to come to Christ because they've seen Christ and experienced Christ in our life. The people that we affect, when we live like we need to live, those people closest to us will be affected. To the point of set apart, sanctified, the Spirit of God rests on them. They have greater possibility of knowing the Lord. The effect is that we influence other people. In this world, I don't know about you, I'm speaking for Jay. But I come before you as a needy person today telling you that in prayer I need a softening. I mean, there's a hardness. It's easy to be hard. It's easy to be hard that people that name it and claim it, the people that possess it, are, but they, they, they profess it, but they don't possess it. The hardness that comes in the world that we live in, where people are taking shots every day at the kingdom, people are taking shots every day at the Bible, people are taking every, shots every day at the church, the child of God. Just yesterday, I was watching, I had been, I'd been studying a good bit yesterday, and I'm sitting in my lazy boy, and, and, and everybody had sort of left, and all of a sudden, something came over my phone, and, and when I looked at one thing, there was another one. It started rolling. Before long, it was political stuff, and I'd watched about 10 or 15 minutes of stuff, and it was both sides of the aisle, and it was both political parties, and it was all kind of craziness, and in about 15 minutes, I felt oppression, and I don't preach much on this because I don't want to lose people, but I'm telling you something, I felt oppression. I mean, the enemy is in the room. I mean, I can sense things come over me like you just wait. You get up there and preach on prayer. And you get up there and you keep dividing the church and it's not going to end well. And I had all these thoughts coming. And it's the world that we live in. We live in a jaded world. If we don't watch it, we'll almost want to build a fence around ourselves so nobody else can get in. But that is not what God called us to do. God needs to break our heart. God needs to soften our heart and for us to realize that he's called us not just to have a head knowledge, but to have a heart. Let's move with compassion because of the state of the world and what it's in. I love the story of Mary and Martha and Jesus after Lazarus had died. You remember? I do love this story because I would have done something totally different. Mary and Martha, they meet Jesus and they're crying and they're weeping and wailing. And he's just showing up and he knows he's going to raise him from the dead. You know, he's just sleeping. I'm going to raise him from the dead. And they're just, they're wailing. You know, two sisters whining. You know, if I'd have known I was going to raise him from the dead. I'd have said, would y'all just get out of the way and stop all this mess? I'm going to show you something today. But it says he wept. You know why he wept? Because Mary and Martha were hurting. And we miss it now. Listen to me. We miss it because what we do with people's weeping is we find out why they're weeping. And if it doesn't add up to something we think is worthy of it, then we pass it off. So we become non-compassionate and uncompassionate instead of being moved by what people are going through regardless of how they got there. We do a little case history and we say, well, they haven't lived right. and They've acted like the devil. They've made terrible choices. So I'm not going to be moved. And we're living in a society, folks. And let me tell you something. And in the church where we should be moved. And I'm saying I'm the president of the club. Because you can get so jaded that you're not moved the way God wants us to be moved. And let me tell you something. If you're not moved... You won't pray. Hmm. We pray for stuff that moves us. Even if it's wrong, even if it's stuff that we're full of ourselves, it still moved us enough to pray for it. So today I want to just remind you, we need to have competence, but we also need to have compassion. Listen to this. This is the interlude. Our head and our heart, both of what we are shit, says today we better be praying. Look around, folks, at the world situation. The whole outlook. We need God, and we need a God movement. 
in the worst of ways. Hmm. Wow. Today's a little bit different. Uh, some time ago, Brian Tomlinson asked us about prayer. Knowing where we were going and thinking along these lines, and today's that day. Brian, if you'll get ready. Brian, in just a moment, is going to pray for us. He's also lead us in prayer. He's also going to announce something pretty unique about prayer that's just come down the, the, the pike here just yesterday. And he's going to share with you something. Then he's going to lead us in prayer, and we're going to continue on. Brian, the platform's yours. Thank you. Um, a friend of mine, we were talking, and she said, I wish we could just gather at Barry's Cross and pray. I said, why can't we? She said, well, I don't know. I said, well, who owns it? So she said, well, let me call. Ends up, it's private property. Mr. Barry owns the cross. He built it. And uh, so she talked to him and said, hey, you know, we'd like to pray. And uh, we're going to keep it small, you know, friends and family. He said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it big. He's like, I, I know the mayor. I know the governor. I know the police department. I know state troopers. He said, do not worry about security. Do not worry about the city. Do not worry about publicity. You all just get here. He said, I will handle all of that. You know, he, he, so he has promised police presence, uh, security for Christians to come and, and, and pray. Um, it's not an organized group. It's just me and a friend that said, hey, let's do this. It's not affiliated with any church. Um, it's just people coming together and, and, and Mr. Barry giving us the opportunity to do it. So August 8th at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., um, we're going to have people who, if they want to come, they can stay in your cards if you want to, or you can come outside, you can social distance, whatever you want to do, I don't care. But if it's 10 people, if it's 1,000, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever God wants it to be is what it's going to be. And so we're going to all gather, whoever is there, everyone's invited. If, if you don't want to be there, just reserve that time um, for prayer at your house or just with us. So again, write it down, text yourself, tell your friends, August 8th, it's a Saturday morning, uh, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. If it bleeds over, we told him we didn't want to do it and disrupt his business. He said, you don't worry about my business. Y'all just get here and pray. He, he actually told my friend, I've been waiting for people to do this. Um, so, you know, I've been pushing for prayer on social media. And there's a song that says, you know, someone asking God why. And he said, well, well, I created you. And I was pushing for someone else to do it. And then God finally said, Brian, that's why I created you. So I said, okay, and we're going to do it. So uh, I'll lead us in prayer. Thank you for joining us for this week's program from Lakeshore Church in Byron, Mississippi. Next week, Pastor Jay Frazier will continue this important sermon on the components of prayer. Be sure to tune in or join us online on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Thank you for being with us today. We trust that God has spoken to you. Um, just let God do what He wants to do in your life. Again, we're thankful for you being a part of it. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day.